Coming up on this week in computer hardware, we got the best TVs of 2018 with Robert Heron, AMD's Ryzen 5 2500U mobile APU performance. Raven Ridge is here, battling server CPUs from AD and Intel, and a Spectre patch you can trust and install. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 452, recorded February 8th, 2018. It's a good year to buy a new TV, people. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show. The name is to bring you the most useful, most engaging, most affordable, most delightful, most expensive, most crazed, most mobile, most desktop hardware news available in this or any other known universe. I'm Patrick Norton, joined today by Mr. Robert Heron. Robert, are you with us, sir? I, I believe I am, and thank you for inviting me. Hey, man, thanks for joining us. We should talk, um, you know, the, the obligatory mention uh, before we really get going is that GPU prices are still high. <laughs> Glad I got in early. <laughs> Although yeah, I don't think you know, the, I thought I, I don't think the GPU I have is actually anything anyone wants. I ended up grabbing a what is that? A six gigabyte ten sixty as a as an appropriate match for my current CPU power. So, and I'm oh, I'm wow. thrilled with the damn thing. It's it's perfect. It was a nice boost from what I had anyway. So, technically, you know the GeForce GTX ten eighty is down to $925, uh, according to Camel, 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 uh, if you can actually find it. That's a third-party new price from a that seller. Seems expensive, no? Questionable problem. Well, it is expensive, <laughs> but considering they were selling for 1100 a couple days ago, it may be cheap, Oof. and 1400 a couple weeks before that. Compared to the uh, MSRP, it's spectacularly expensive. You um, can buy a lot of quality SSDs for that much money and uh, probably a lot get a great system for that price so you have a great three-day weekend in Vegas um, maybe well at least on the maybe maybe you operate <laughs> slightly more extravagant <laughs> budget in Vegas than I do. oh my goodness in any case GPU prices <laughs> have not come down um, but I take uh, it this is due to the cryptocurrency mining yeah. shenanigans or just everyone uh, trying to I don't know, mine everything in sight, apparently. Is it, is it say, all cryptocurrencies, or is there one in particular that seems to be driving the whole... Ethereum is probably the big one. Um, oh, wait. Hold on. Did I just add... Uh-oh. Oh, my goodness. I need to call... I need, I need to immediately call a friend of mine, because I just found an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1080... For seven hundred and thirty dollars in stock at Best Buy. If I fall over, it's the shock, people. Um. <laughs> but but who makes it? It's an EVGA. It's fine. Oh, that's cool. They're awesome. Yeah. So. Oh my goodness, I get distracted. Uh, we should talk to you about as exciting as as overpriced GPUs are. Um, you are actually a television expert, and uh, we should probably uh, talk to you about what you saw at uh, CES this year. I mean, there, you know, go, oh, go ahead. There were many good things at CES regarding TVs. That's probably the biggest TV show in the United States, at least every year. Come January, that second week of January, it kicks off. Many, many new exciting products being announced. Probably good to start with Samsung in the sense that they really didn't show any consumer TVs. They were only really showing off their, the wall which is their modular-based direct-lit micro-LED display system, very similar to what they use in their cinema production or their cinema display systems that they've installed in a couple countries now. This is not going to be cheap. It's starting at 146 inches to get the appropriate 4K-ish resolution. You can scale this up as big as you want. Prices haven't been announced, but I would, I would be willing to say it's approaching six figures. It is going to deliver epic brightness, full DCI color spec, and because it is literally using, for each subpixel, its own individual micro LED, when you turn those off, they aren't emitting any light. So you get excellent black levels, excellent viewing angles, and just a dynamic viewing experience. But that's definitely not for everyone. I think 
Of course, one of the best values we encountered last year was TCL and their P series, that P607, a 55 inch screen that delivered ample light output, support for all the popular HDR formats, in addition to having Roku TV built in. And that turned out to be the phenomenal value that you could score for about 650 bucks if you were in the market for something in that size range, that 55 inch screen size. This year, they're gonna bring back, bring back the six series just straight up. And that's going to be very similar in performance to what we were seeing last year. Uh, it will incorporate an updated frame design, making it look a lot more premium in terms of just the styling of the TV itself. It also incorporates the latest rev of Roku TV, which they were showing off. That incorporated a bunch of cool features, especially if you do over-the-air tuning, where you use an antenna to receive your broadcast content for free. Roku TV is updating their platform to incorporate a two-week channel guide as well as improve search functions to find the content you're looking for, no matter where it may be, be it streaming services or over-the-air broadcasts or however. And perhaps the favorite part of my whole announcement related to the Roku software update was the fact that it's going to be applied to all the Roku products going back to 2014, at least the TVs. So that's just going to be one of the fantastic values you'll be able just to everyone will be able to enjoy in terms of going forward. And if you have that Roku product, expect that software to be pushing soon, so to speak. Uh, who else was at the show? Sony. Sony always shows off cool stuff in their booth uh, regarding usually not in, in addition to all their new 4K TVs, be it LCD or OLED. They were also showing off a prototype display as well. This was a 85 inch 8K screen highlighting their new X1 Ultimate prototype video processor. Key features on this TV, 10,000 nit light output. And yeah, uh, beautiful. DCI color spec, all of it. This is effectively a TV for the first time I've seen anywhere that matches the spec for HDR and 4K video. And the beauty there is, is that when it's fed a signal, say from an ultra high depth Blu-ray disc, say that disc is describing a scene with a 4,000 nit highlight in it or a 6,000 nit highlight or a glint off a piece of chrome. The TV doesn't have to really do anything processing wise to map that into lower performance levels. It simply says, oh, you need a 8,000 nit highlight in the scene. There it is. And those, those types of processing are referred to as tone mapping. And so effectively now you have a, a prototype display. Yeah, but Generally, this will be something you'll see in a couple more years down the road. But you have a display that can effectively match the performance characteristics of the HDR spec. And it is phenomenal in terms of image quality. I stood literally three feet away from the display, 10,000 nits. It's not as if the whole screen is pure white blowing out that kind of light. It's really just the highlights in the scene. And the cues you get from especially natural content, be it they were shooting some beautiful vehicles, outdoor nature scenes, and things like that. It's far more realistic than you could, than anything I've ever seen before in terms of it looked like an outdoor daylight scene, and it wasn't. It wasn't overwhelming to my eyes. And the other factor it really well, highlighted for me. <laughs> oh, go ahead. We should, oh, is, we should put this into context because, you know, we saw a lot of stuff at CES 2018 from like, oh my goodness, you know, Samsung's going to catch up to, oh my goodness, OLEDs from LG got better to, oh my goodness, oh, yeah. you know, Hisense is back in it. But the thing that blew you away more than anything else was having this 10K television from Sony that was delivering an absolute full HDR spec. I just want to put that in. Just, totally. You were talking about that for like a week and a half afterwards with great it, it, intensity and admiration. It's <laughs> that fact that I really expected it to take a lot longer to get a TV that could do full spec HDR, considering the, uh, the spec itself defines a certain color output. The, no TV is hitting the full Rec 2020 color palette, but the one most commonly used within Hollywood is called DCI, and it's a subset of that, larger than our current HD color palette, and it provides more saturated realistic colors, especially when you're dealing with very saturated objects, be it a, a beautiful Ferrari red paint job or the Caribbean blue in certain scenes, that, that cyan color that's just unobtainable in the old spec. And, and not only that, but with that amount of light output, it can literally match it without having to resort, resort to tone mapping. And beyond that, the other thing it really highlighted to me was that we talk about LG's OLEDs and OLED technology in general, that ability to do that perfect black 
really improves the perception of color saturation. Colors look more saturated when they have a dark color next to them. Or if the if it is a black background and that is pure black, the colors will look more rich and vibrant compared to a TV that has a black level that is not quite pure black, maybe a dull gray or even a dark gray. On the other end of that is when you have a TV that can dump out 10,000 nits, that alone also makes color look more saturated and bright. Physically, the colors are brighter coming off the screen and into your eyes. That was as impressive to my eyes as is a pure black you know, background, say, on an OLED screen. Now, uh, when the Sony TV did go to a full black screen, it clearly didn't have the absolute best black levels ever. However, it was a pure prototype, and it was fantastic to look at. Other than that, they showed off a brand new, or I should say an updated OLED screen for this year that gets away from the the easel style design of last year with the A1E and the 8F8, I believe it is called. That will feature a more traditional design, yet still integrating Sony's uh, application of a technology that allows them to produce sound directly out of the screen itself. The screen is the set of stereo speakers using physical actuators on the back of the TV that vibrate that glass in such a way to produce sound that that for all intents and purposes comes directly out of the picture itself. But you have to back that up with a little bit of low end performance too. Usually in the case of the A1E, they had a four inch speaker built into that TV to provide the a little bass oomph. And on this TV, they're they're switching, I believe, to a couple of smaller speakers to achieve similar effect. So that is just going to be, in addition, I think, just a fantastic product. LG, of course, they were highlighting the new 8 Series panels, showing off many cool things about it. I didn't see anything to say that the absolute performance of the panels will change much from last year, the 7 Series, to this year. The, the jump from the 6 Series to the 7 Series was significant in terms of lots of little things that added up to a much better picture. For the 8 Series, I'd say the picture quality is going to be very similar. But they've added a few new features, including Google Assistant, that worked flawlessly. And perhaps more important to a video file would be something called black frame insertion. The TVs will be able to insert a dark frame between the typically held images that are used in LCDs and OLEDs when displaying motion video. This will improve the perception of motion resolution to the point of what plasmas were capable of doing back in the day. The gold standard for motion resolution has always been a plasma screen because of its, the nature of how it produces imagery. This mm -hmm. feature called black frame insertion, by adding that to the OLEDs, you're effectively creating something very similar with the trade-off being some reduced light output. Now, with the Sony A1E last year, they actually introduced this feature already. However, it and I've seen this on other LCDs as well that employ similar technology, but it can it can add a flicker to the screen that is at best annoying and at worst unwatchable. And on the 8 series OLEDs from LG coming out this year, I saw at least no perceptible flicker to my eye and it, it was good enough to where I would really consider leaving it on all the time. If you can take a sacrifice in the light output a little bit, you will achieve phenomenal motion resolution without resorting to motion compensation and estimation techniques that can introduce an overly smooth picture, particularly with movies, where, you know, in order to get that motion resolution out of an LCD, if you went into the video processing settings, you would be enabling things that would make that picture go from looking like cinema to looking like video, where it's just too smooth on everything. And mm -hmm. it, it appeared effective, it appeared wonderful, and absolutely loved it. Another super geeky thing for the new LG TVs is a, the ability to go in and write calibration tables directly to the TV. And we're, we're talking something that goes far beyond just simple grayscale and color setup. This can incorporate anywhere from 100 to a few thousand points of calibration detail. Being able to measure this, directly write it to the TV's what they call the lookup table, and then have it effectively across the entire color palette and through a range of luminances produce something that's really approaching what you get out of pro monitors on the pro side of things. And while it is kind of nerdy, it does require special software and the gear to do it. It looked and performed phenomenally, and I can't wait to see the final iteration of that and to get it in my hands. It will simply make those TVs, especially anyone that wants to use them in a pro environment, far better and, or eliminate the need for adding a separate lookup table box. And, and at least as a video nerd, I find that is 
that's the right way to do it. You compare that to say Samsung's TVs that introduced an auto cal feature last year that literally is only controlling the controls already built into the TV through the main menu system. And this is far more detailed. You can, literally with the higher end OLEDs, you'll be accessing up to 35,000 points of correction information. And while you're not gonna be programming each one of those separately, uh, this will enable just phenomenal, accurate picture quality across the board. Uh, TCL, America's fastest growing TV brand. You mentioned earlier that it was kind of yeah. like that 55 inch uh, television was everybody's pick for the best deal uh, for a 4K HDR TV last year. Oh, I wanted to say too, they are going to bring the 65 inch out this year as well as part of their new series, six series TVs. And uh, that worked so well last year at such a good price point. That's just going to be, I think, your your go-to option if you're on a budget. And nothing I saw there <laughs> in any way showed me that they were going backwards in terms of keeping that 6 Series uh, a high-performing, compatible set with things like Dolby right. Vision, HDR10, and probably even HLG down the road. Now, over in the Hisense booth, they showed off some phenomenal new uh, 4K televisions that use quantum dot technology to improve the color palette. In addition to their H10 is going to provide up to, I believe a thousand zones of local dimming, 2000 nits of light output. And there is seriously something going on with the LCD manufacturers on the high end, at least in terms of off axis viewing. I am seeing far less glare and halo effects that might appear on say a bright object on a dark scene. It is approaching the look of what I would think of as OLED like performance. And Hisense typically is going to bring this at a very competitive price point. And I, this is one of those TVs where it just catches your attention because of that, that expanded color palette and that deep dark black with lots of zones of local dimming. And I, that, that should be at the top of everyone's list to check out as soon as it rolls. And they also had an H9 Plus, which will be an edge lit based system as well that came really close to what the H10 was doing. And I I think those are gonna be two, two wonderful sets to compare to even some of the very best LCDs coming out this year. Now I will say in a private meeting with Samsung, they did show off a prototype of their upcoming consumer models. And it was a can demo in, a, in, a, you know, in their private suite, but what they showed was so close to what I expect out of an OLED that I, I almost didn't believe what I was seeing and I'm still, pouring over my notes in terms of technically what they're doing to achieve not only exceptional black levels, but the ability to control those halo and blooming artifacts, in addition to the off axis viewing, something I expect every LCD just to simply get worse and worse. The further you move off dead center straight on, typically the screen gets the black levels increase, the colors wash out, things like that. I was seeing very little of that in the demos I was presented. Granted, they were demos, there isn't even a model number for these things yet, but uh, pretty phenomenal stuff if, if what I saw holds to the final shipping product. Now, Samsung also introduced in a super premium 85 inch 4K, 4K or, I wanna, yeah, I think it pretty was 4K, I don't think it was 8K, but they have a, a premium set coming down the road that has up to 10,000 zones of local dimming, 4,000 nits of light output, and at an 85 inch screen size, then that, you know, you're, you're talking a solid five figures for that. But again, phenomenal performance. I, I thought the LCD guys were going to crawl into a hole after last year with OLED just kind of dominating everything. But that is not the case. And I think uh, for sure, 2018 is going to be the best LCDs on the planet in terms of the at least the premium models. My goodness. It's going to be an I don't know. It seems like it's another good year to buy televisions uh, outside of LG separating the models uh where last year you essentially had the same glass and the same processor. Now, if you pay more money, you get a better processor. Um, with that's pretty much the same glass. Um, that's but it still seems like I it's going to be a good year for televisions. I, it, I think this will be the best year yet. And also because of new production techniques and new factories coming online, the larger OLED screens, particularly that 77 inch, that may be the drill worthy thing you want, but you look at the price tag and it's like, eh, maybe something else they have new facilities coming online that are gonna make that cheaper. And that 77 inch size is gonna creep down into the C series. So mm -hmm. I'm really hoping we'll see something in like the 
hopefully the eight thousand dollar range maybe for eventually for that 77 inch panel making it far more affordable than what it was even a year ago right well oh, i don't know uh, going back to lg though real quick hdr projectors <laughs> wow. going back to lg <laughs> no, yeah, uh, just going back to LG real quick, uh, they did show off two new processors. You did mention the differentiation compared to last year where we had similar chipsets and similar glass across the entire line for the most part. Uh, for, for 2018, they are breaking it up just a little bit. My understanding is that the glass will be the same in terms of absolute picture performance, but within the TVs themselves, their, their entry level, the B series, is going to use a processor that's a step back from what the C and above series are going to use. Effectively similar on most aspects, except for some specific functions related to doing high frame rate and HDR at the same time, in addition to the addressable calibration points that I could go in and dial a TV into. It should still look and perform beautifully. However, if you're looking for the absolute best from LG this year, it's going to be their OLED starting in the C series and up. And also, going back to Hisense, just one last thing. They did show off a 4K <laughs> laser projector that at first I thought was simply just a bump up in luminance. They're, they're talking, oh, we're instead of our 100-inch screen size, we're going to have 150-inch. And I'm like, okay, well, you just bump the light output up. But no, this will be that, that model I've, I've mentioned before that incorporates a dual laser setup where they're using a red and a blue laser with appropriate phosphors and... The key here is, is that it will be able to deliver, they're claiming 100% of the DCI color palette with a true 4K DLP imager in a package that also incorporates smart TV functionality. So you have your apps and streaming stuff built in, in addition to just, just uh, Harman Kardon audio. Uh, but having that dual color laser setup and being able to achieve full DCI color with a 4K imager is something that is reserved for only the super premium projectors that are two or three times the cost currently. And if they can hit a $10,000 price point or less, and they're claiming they're going to have this out by the end of the year, that is just going to be one to keep your eye on to see to see if they can deliver on that. Because uh, that just represents a, a price point for technology that we really don't have access to yet. Usually when you think of 4K projectors, you're either getting a projector that has true 4K resolution, but it has the old school color palette. And... Right. None of these TVs will be able to produce the light output of an LCD. Uh, none of these projectors will be able to produce the light output of a, of a premium LCD. However, these are laser-based as well, at least the ones from Hisense and others that I'm talking about. And that gives you the robust ability to just run that system continuously for, you know, they're claiming 20 plus thousand hours without needing to change a, a bulb or a lamp. And that should just provide just ample output and the only other company i've seen do this dual color laser setup currently available is through christie digital and they have some pro projectors that they use in commercial installations that feature this technology but i haven't seen anything for the home yet and hisense claims they're building all of this in-house and it's all covered under their patents and i am really looking forward to that as well and one last thing in the hisense booth they did show off a live atsc3 demo using uh, a transmitter literally that was mounted five feet away. But the TV hardware was using what was built in to receive that signal, display 4K HDR content that looked fantastic. In addition to a mobile device they had there as well that was receiving the same signal. So one of the things to think about about the new broadcast format coming up is that it will be delivering 4K HDR to the home if you're close enough to the towers and in addition to that, it will also be delivering to mobile devices that are compatible with this as well. Probably not in 4K, but TV on your phone, a live TV feed that you can pick up when you're, you're near the broadcast towers should be usable for, I think, quite a few people and should be pretty cool. And I'm also looking forward to some of the other specs that they've wrapped into ATSC3 that relate to how it's transmitted. And it should help improve distance and its ability to deal with multipath interference and other features like that that can degrade your signal. Or if you're living right on the border of getting a, a watchable picture or not, I'm really hoping that these new tuners and technology will go a long way toward helping folks who uh, want to enjoy some free TV with appropriate hardware uh, in, a, in, in the best way possible. We should probably mention one last thing uh, from Hisense before we move on, which was your favorite thing in the Hisense booth, which was not actually a product that Hisense has any interest in shipping. Oh, <laughs> they, 
Hisense, uh, I visited the with them a couple TV. of years back. They have these cool retro TVs, literally, yeah. And they, they take an LCD panel, 4K, decent performance. It looks great, probably on the value side of things more than the high performance. But the chassis it's installed in really throws back to the old retro designs with a physical knob or two, in addition to rabbit ears that incorporate uh, ATSC tuner. And they they look fantastic, just in as an eye-catching design, and the knobs themselves felt fan- that 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 right there, baby. That thing <laughs> that was fun to play <laughs> with, and it, it it worked really well. And yeah, this is something the design group likes to show off, but generally they never seem to make their way into stores. And I think if they can hit the right price point, that would attract. I think more eyeballs, given how boring many of the the value TVs look in terms of just right. just their physical design. This was something kind of unique, eye catching, and uh, I hate to use the word cute, but yeah, it was cute as hell. I, I really <laughs> I really like those TVs for some reason. It's just uh, something a little different. That's uh, that's cute as hell. Is a pretty high endorsement. <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully, I'll, hopefully, High Sense appreciates it. So. <laughs> I would imagine. Uh, AMD Ryzen 5 2500U mobile APU performance. We're talking Raven Ridge here as in um, I, I, I excited about this, right? We've been talking about this for a while. Um, you know, this is this is uh, a quad core mobile CPU with Radeon Vega graphics uh, in a 15 watt TDP, which basically means uh, GPU performance a little bit better, hopefully, than Intel. You know, that's pretty exciting, right? Of course, we also at CES, you know, had the confirmation on the Kaby Lake G platform, the Intel with the uh, Vega graphics. Um, but Ken over at PC Per got to play around with a uh, HP Envy X360 laptop that was running a Ryzen 5 2500U. Probably not with the SSD it's going to ship with. There's some questions about that, but 8 gigabytes of DDR, 15.6 inch uh, 1920 by 1080 monitor. Um, the storage, which is kind of a question mark, that one terabyte Samsung PM961 NVMe SSD. Um, but, uh, you know, a pretty good set of specs, $1,329, which is kind of typical for a for a fairly, uh, uh, well, you know, I thought it was thin and light, but it looks like it's weighing in at 4.75 pounds, so it's not that light. Um, but the, the caveat on this one was the power consumption. The chart you're looking at right now, that top set of bars uh, is a Ryzen 5 2500U and that HP X360. You know, and you're maxing out at like 41 to 43 watts if you're looking at Counter-Strike or Rocket League. Um, the one that's higher at 52 watts, that's a Core i5-8250 system with a GTX uh, 150 inside of it, I want to say, or an MX150 inside of it. So that's a discrete uh, NVIDIA graphics package, if I'm not mistaken. So the, the power is considerably higher, um, about 30% higher than most of the other uh, uh, GPU, like CPUs sitting in that space. Um, but the, GP, the CPU and gaming performance is not bad. Um, not epic, but certainly hanging there with a Core i5-7200 or a Core i5-8250U, um, you know, looking at single-thread performance, uh, multi-thread performance, um, you know, a little bit lagging, um, but... Uh, Gaming performance looks solid, though. And I think, yeah. I mean, for me personally, I, I don't think I'll ever buy a notebook that weighs more than three pounds again. So being able to get these kind of... <laughs> Being able to get these kind of components crammed into thinner, more power efficient designs is where right. I want it to go anyway. I'm I'm currently using Intel integrated graphics and I ain't getting anywhere near any of those levels of performance in my current right. relatively new notebook. But at the same point, uh, I'm also rolling around with something that weighs over a pound less. So, yeah, that's a big deal. I mean, it's been interesting. Like I'm looking at I should point out the Cinebench. It's actually ahead of that Core i5-8250U. I always forget. Uh, which one is higher and lower in that one? But it's kind of crazy to look at those 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 gaming numbers look pretty good. Um, you know, they're obviously getting beat by the one with the discrete graphics, but you're looking at a pretty good. You know, compared to the other, you know, compared to the four i five eighty two fifty U, it's delivering a, a you know a, a pretty nice jump in performance. Again, if you go to discrete graphics, it gets crushed, but that's a, a kind of a totally different market segment. Um, so it's, it's good. Uh, I don't think we have final pricing numbers on this. Um, uh, although it seems to be pretty solid in that $1,300 range. I'm kind of curious to see how many vendors adopt this 
and when it comes out. And I mean, it's also funny that you mentioned about the performance on the ultralight laptops because I got to take a look at what should have been a significantly faster processor inside of a uh, Microsoft uh, laptop. And what was amazing is because it was fanless, um, it could not run that Core i7 processor that the at anywhere near the top speed. So oh, I bet. You know, my, my technically, you know, several, you know, it was, you know, compared to the, the slower processor in my XPS 13, which has a pretty robust cooling system, the performance of that uh, that uh, Microsoft laptop was <laughs> was considerably lower. And that was... Um, that was surprising to me. Um, you know, well, if, I mean, if you it, don't have that active cooling, you would assume that yeah. you're never going to hit the peak performance of that thing, unless unless you're using it out in the cold or something. But that's, yeah, that's a good point. That's, it, it's nice you to know. have no sound coming from a PC, but even my right. ultra ultra lightweight notebook has a little fan built into it that I do hear kick up whenever I'm doing anything uh, CPU intensive or GPU intensive. So. It's, I think it's just frustrating at this point when you're looking at like a three thousand dollar laptop that performs considerably slower than a laptop that sells for just over half the price. You know, I, <laughs> your three thousand dollar laptop with a faster processor should be at least as fast as something that costs uh, considerably less. Uh, I don't know. It was it was a curious one to look at. Uh, something kind of came out of the blue and blew me away. Um, you start mixing metaphors for the sheer and bridal joy of it. Uh, Mozilla is created the Things Gateway and uh, build your own Web of Things Gateway on a Raspberry Pi. So, um, you know, you'll need USB dongles to do Zigbee and Z Wave, but they have a pre built Raspberry Pi OS image um, that their goal is to turn uh, a Raspberry Pi into a controller for all the Internet of Things devices in your house. So, this is kind of their next step from Project Things by Mozilla. That's their framework of software and services. The idea that they're gonna create this open platform for vendors to work on, which I'm kind of excited about. I don't know if anybody will adopt it because obviously we have these big battles going on uh, for controlling the home and voice automation and the home and everything else. But uh, I'm pretty excited. I'm gonna start playing around with Things Gateway this weekend. Um, That's and pretty it's cool. Sweet. I yeah. mean, the fact that uh, you can just simply plug in the dongles you plan to use, be it for, like you mentioned, the Zigbee or the Z-Wave technologies, if those are the devices right. and, and of the IoT things you're using in your home. This might bring some of the control back into your hands, at least. I'm more curious about the software interface they're going to be providing within their, within their OS build for this to see how, how you go about setting things up. Will it require any kind of cloud connection, or is it something you literally could do on a local scale to really just well, sort of... Lock it down, if nothing else. So, if you go into hacksmozilla.org, they've got sort of the complete cons uh, the complete set of instructions on it. And to add things, you click on a you know it's it's actually a very nicely designed screen. I just put a link into the show notes for this one. Um, you click on a plus icon on the bottom right of the screen. Um, puts all the attached adapters into pairing mode. You'll see a couple of devices show up on the thing screen. There, that's when the devices show up. And scroll down to the next window. Um, you know, and it will give you sort of like options for that. Uh, it, it's reporting like that shows the plug reporting its power consumption, its voltage, its current and frequency. And you scroll down and it's crazy because you can access a rules engine and they allow you to set if this, then that style rules for, you know, uh, to chain devices together, make devices work together, you know, and the example there is if smart plug A turns on, turn on smart plug B. So it looks like a really aesthetically pleasing uh, array. It has the ability to put a floor plan in there so you can position your devices and figure out where they are in your house. Um, you know, they've got I think for wikis. tablet use, I see a lot of people adopting tablets and putting them in wall mount brackets simply to have that kind of, you know, touchscreen display control right within the home. And yeah. if this is going to be simply something you can, you can full screen on a device like that, that brings some functionality where you can really simplify the use of, of a home full of these types of devices for the rest of the family members who, who really need it simplified in order to make it something acceptable within the household itself. So I, that looks cool. And I, I look forward to actually checking that out. I, I have a Raspberry Pi that is currently, I think, unused at the moment. And considering how easy it is to simply swap out an SD card 
for another one to, you know, add an IoT OS. Why not? This looks like something I would definitely want to try out. And we've had, I'll be curious to see if you can do anything, what other devices I can control with this as well, beyond, say, Zigbee and Z-Wave. Maybe, oh. maybe it's just limited to that for a good reason, though. So <laughs> we'll see. Those would probably be the most popular ones. But yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, Kyle over at Hard OCP has got a fun, uh, fun project going where they basically decided to pay for a Threadripper, um, an AMD 1950X, uh, with cryptocurrency mining. So, um, you know, okay. this, was, this was pitched to them by AMD. Uh, it was not something they came up with, um, but uh, I was laughing about that where the idea of can you generate enough, uh, can you mine enough coin, cryptocurrency, to pay for the cost of a Threadripper 1950X? And I believe the answer is yes. And if you're curious about that one, I'm going to send you to uh, Hard OCP. Um, you know, that's a $900 16-core 32-thread uh, processor. And I thought it was kind of interesting uh, to see that. Uh, and the CPU and GPU combined, you're looking at about 335 watts to get 2,005 hashes per second. So the hash rates are pretty good on that. Um, that's about one as in-depth on in that as I can go. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, one of the conversations we had with somebody at CES was related to this very subject. And they described their own personal setup where it would dynamically look at all the available mined, mineable currencies, switch between what everyone was providing the most profit on a real-time basis. So they weren't just doing right. one particular type of mining. They were, they were covering all their bases and then having the system they had set up trip and stumble, not trip and stumble, but trip itself right. to switch between the different currencies when appropriate for, for maximum profit or whatever they were, probably what their goal was. But I was, <laughs> I'm surprised it, it, that was just one person. So you think there's probably quite a few people doing something similar. And with, geez, with the Samsung the announcement pricing. recent too, <laughs> with their, Samsung's actually gotten into the business now of making cryptocurrency pr ASICs straight up. Uh, they had Four demonstrated- <laughs> That's true. They had demonstrated, uh, I think it was at Cedia. I think they actually had a tower of how to repurpose old cell phones. And they actually took like about 20 of their Galaxy 5 phones and put them together to make a, a miner that way as well. But seeing systems like these, and I'd be curious to see on hard OCP how they did their software setup to how they, you know, how they will deal with the variety of currencies out there and, and how they pick and choose between them in terms of trying to Trying to make a system that pays for itself, at least. I like the idea. Toys sure. that pay for themselves are good. Oh, my goodness. Um, Delegates Epic with AMD. Uh, good article. This in the register. Um, basically, uh, Dell's, bringing, uh, uh, Dell's bringing one or two socket rack mount servers, says the register, using AMD Epic processors along time, alongside its Xeon SP server family. Um, the Epic processor says uh, the register is said to be faster than equivalent Xeons. Um, so it's interesting to watch uh, AMD start to pick up, hopefully, a little traffic in the uh, server market. Um, and then sort of at the same time that's happening, uh, Intel is uh, refreshing the Skylake-based Xeon D systems on a chip. So um, 2100 I series. Oop, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I have a preference, at least on workstations, for the server-style chips. They, they generally are, they seem like better parts overall in the fact that they also typically run at much cooler temperatures compared to, say, the, the regular desktop processors. So right. it, 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 they also seem to overclock quite nicely as well, at least a version that would be unlocked or, or capable of being uh, played with in that manner. So uh, don't. I don't discount Xeon as something that's only for servers. I also look at it for potentially just making a solid workstation as well. So, Well, in, uh, in this case, a lot of these, I mean, you're talking about processors that start at, uh, start at $500, uh, top up at you know, $2,400 for a 18-core uh, CPU. So these are, these are pretty ninja point. stuff. Uh, ninja <laughs> parts, I should say. Um, what's kind of crazy is they're saying, uh, quote, 
uh, Tim Berry uh, up on PC Per. Uh, according to Intel, the new chips are squarely aimed at edge computing and offer up to 2.9 times the network performance, 2.8 times the storage performance, and 1.6 times the compute performance of the previous generation Xeon D 1500 series. So that's that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty huge jump, <coughs> you know. And you're looking at like quick assist technology uh, for hardware accelerated encryption and decryption. Uh, you know, four DDR4 memory channels that can hit up to 512 gigabytes of DDR4, um, you know, like four 10 gigabit Ethernet controllers, 32 lanes of PCIe. I mean, these are massive high performance, uh, high performance chips. So the, uh, you know, I got to ask, you know, anything, uh, anything else you're excited about? I mean, what are you excited about in home theater right now? We do, uh, uh, I should point out, Robert Heron and I do a podcast called AV Excel. It's about home theater and audio. We love the headphones. We love the screens. We got deep on the screens for you there. Uh, wh- what are you most excited about right now? Would it be well, cold in Korea? Uh, it's freezing there, no doubt. Uh, however, I would say that demonstration of being able to access a lookup table on a TV, a consumer TV, in the case of LG's new 8 Series panels, and I believe this will apply to at least one of their LCDs, the, the premium SK9500 as well. That just brings them into a level where it, it makes my job easier a little bit. And it also makes for just arguably the best type of calibration you can do on a panel like that, short of adding additional hardware externally in order to do something similar. That for me is just going to be the big one. Yeah, the good folks at... Spectracal, now owned by Portrait Displays, uh, with their Calman software, is the we were using alpha versions of this software, and it seemed to work really, really well. And for that, I am I am super excited about. What else? Ah, in in the quest for looking at what's upcoming in these TVs, I realized that I'm I'm just about at the limit of what my calibration gear can handle in terms of light output. I believe mm-hmm. both of my meters currently top out at around 1,600 nits or so. And that gets me to about 90 plus percent of all the displays I deal with. But uh, sooner than later, I'm going to be seeing things that go well into the 2,000 plus range. And for that, I have to upgrade my own hardware. And nothing is cheap in this realm as far as I can tell. <laughs> if you, you may as well. Buy good, buy good equipment, and, and it makes your life a little bit easier. But the outlay is, it's a little gives me pause for just a moment. So I have a new, uh, a new signal generator that kind of combines a couple that I'm using right now. So I'll have integrated support for things like Dolby Vision, HDR10, HLG, and all the other potential future formats in one single box. Where I use currently a couple different ones for different aspects of that. In addition to, I'm looking at a meter right now that will handle up to 10,000 nits. And provide even faster performance in the darkest scenes. Uh, typically with a really accurate meter, it tends to go a lot slower when you're trying to measure a very dark color or a dark shade of gray, so to speak. Because of there's just not as much light to trigger the sensors inside. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, I have the bit out right now and I'm, I'm seeing what kind of pricing I can get. And that excites me on just the, the hardware side of it. Uh, beyond that, I'm trying to think of what else. Olympic coverage. I mean, that's the big one for me right now. The, the, I have to say the disappointment of the limited 4K, it effectively, it's very similar to what we were dealing with with the Summer Games last time around in terms of, it's for the most part, all delayed. There will be no live 4K UHD coverage. And then the sources of that content are also quite limited to the two main satellite providers here in North America, in addition to Comcast with their service platform. And of those three, uh, only Comcast is providing an on-demand viewing experience if you have appropriate hardware and subscription packages. So Mm -hmm. this was the one time I really hoped that, at least in North America for NBC, that they would have updated their own streaming app, which is very cool, by the way. I don't want to discount the whole NBC Sports app it makes it simple to schedule, find, view live content, but uh, not in 4K. Uh, oh, also VR, if you want to, hopefully it's better than last time around, but uh, it, it just makes it a great way to watch and keep track of your favorite events in in a way. Or if you missed one of your favorite events, to go back and rewatch it again. 
I was just hoping for this time around we we would see something really taking advantage of today's best TVs in more of a real time or a, yeah, live. It's not like they can't do it. It just never happened or it was the last thing they were thinking about rolling up to the show. Uh, every camera being used to record the Olympics is at a minimum of 4K in HDR, in wide color palette. And it's it's frankly a shame in this day and age that we don't have more of that content more easily accessible. And uh, it's a little disappointing. But at the same point, hey, we're <laughs> the games have already started. So we can get our curling on. We can get the uh, ski jump events. And then we have the opening ceremonies tomorrow night. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for the next <laughs> summer games, at least, that this mess will be shaken out a little bit better. Maybe, maybe they're all waiting for ATSC 3 for some reason, although there's no reason they can't. And at least here in North America, we've seen live events done in 4K60 with HDR effect. Uh, granted, they're usually like a one-off event, but it, it is entirely possible to do this with streaming hardware. And why it didn't happen in time for the, the Winter Games right now is uh, baffling to me, and I'm a little disappointed in that, but not in the amount of coverage that's available and certainly uh, the ease of being able to find this content as well. Oh, I also just found out too, if, if, if you are a subscriber to services like, Play, at least with PlayStation View, I know this for sure, that if you have that subscription already, you can use that to access the NBC Sports app in its entirety uh, if you choose to do so and you want to watch it on a separate device or your mobile or you know uh, another streaming product. But that's one of the beauties. I was... I was wondering if it was going to require, say, a, a Comcast, DirecTV, or Dish Network subscription in order to get access to that, or one of the other cable or satellite providers in, in North America. But apparently there are some over-the-top services, at least with the PlayStation View service, which I've used personally, and I think it's a phenomenal alternative to regular cable or satellite service in terms of cost and what you get and how well it works. So... There are some good options out there. And if you are a person with internet only, there are ways of watching the, the Olympic content live and streaming uh, using at least services like PlayStation View. It's exciting. Something just popped up on my screen. Um, oh, my. Literally, uh, which turns out actually, uh, I don't know how it dropped into the feed it dropped into because it came out late yesterday. But PC World reports that Intel has released stable Spectre patches for Skylake PCs recovering from a bad bout of bugs. Um, so it is if you have a Skylake-based PC and receive a patch to address the Spectre vulnerabilities, install it. Intel has greenlit the code, uh, writes Mark Hockman, who is a fantastic reporter and senior editor over at PC World now. Um, this is you know two weeks after Intel basically said stop. Stop, roll back any of the Spectre or Meltdown patches we sent out. Um, We're ruining old computers left and right. <laughs> and some, well, I mean, Skylake is not that old, right? But uh, uh, Skylake-based Core or Core M processors are safe. And then apparently uh, Haswell and Broadwell patches are in testing, but the final patch code has not shipped yet. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, like U, Y, H, and S series chips, as well as the U twenty three E. See, I'm not, I'm not a... convinced that Intel. If Intel is saying this is safe, I, I, I'm going to wait for a couple of third parties to really hammer on it a little <laughs> bit before, <laughs> to, to see what the real world effect is, in, instead of maybe what the claimed effect is, especially after that last go around, where I, I believe people yeah. were experiencing systems that effectively bricked or got into insane boot loops or other just wackiness afoot when you're trying to... Well, to put this kind of into context, there's a microcode uh, PDF, microcode revision guidance. And, um, <laughs> if you look at this chart, um, you can see kind of where they are in terms of the updates on this. And there's this long list. Scroll down a little bit to the revision list. Um, I could be wrong, but if I'm reading this chart uh, properly, um, the ones with green have the updates. So that looks like it's the uh, that's the Skylake, and uh, and we'll see for Broadwell and Haswell. So exciting stuff, people! 
You've been listening to This Week in Computer Hardware, a.k.a. Twitch. You can find all our older episodes and information on how to subscribe at twit.tv slash twitch. Our regular host is Ryan Shroud of PCPer.com. I am Patrick Norton of TechThing and AVXL.com. And the guy joining us right now from Heron Fidelity and also AVXL, uh, uh, my co-host on AVXL, is Mr. Robert Heron. Robert, thank you so much for making the time today, man. Oh, anytime. It's my pleasure. Thank you. With that, ladies and gentlemen... I'm Patrick Norton. Hey, I am Robert Heron. Catch next week on This Week in Computer Hardware. Or AVXL. Go check it out. AVXL.com. <laughs>